uh, this second um, occasion lecture of our season. And uh, the usual uh, particularities, I want to make sure that I mention them, that, um, well, for one thing, most of you know who I am, uh, Nina Rosenstand, uh, philosophy professor at the Social Sciences Department, and I chair the series, so um, uh, that's why I'm standing here talking. So now I want to introduce our speaker for today, and uh, his name is uh, Jerry Mason, and he is one of our lecturers uh, here at Mesa. Um, he teaches geography, and uh, he happens to be a true hands-on geographer uh, because it is not just, um, uh, shall we say, scholarly uh, engagement as far as he's concerned because he has hands-on training around the world. For one thing, he's been, an ur he's been the urban planner for five years in the San Bernardino County. Um, he is a world traveler. Um, uh, in terms of, of his work, but also in terms of his, um, shall we say, uh, leisurely activities. He is uh, an avid motorcyclist and a scuba diver, a scuba diver in, uh, in oceans around the world. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he is a novelist, and he has published works relating to uh, the topic of Israel, where he has lived, and also the topic of religion. And in addition to that, he's a business owner. Uh, so he has a wide variety of experience in terms of living in and with uh, the environment. So uh, the title of his talk is Creative Solutions for Sustainable Urban Landscapes. Jerry Mason, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. <clears throat> oh, Judy. Judy. As a married man, I don't get applause very often. <laughs> Okay, I just thought that was a, a nice picture. That's from my uh, the balcony of my uh, right off my bedroom at my home in Bonita at a sunrise, and we've got a sunrise on a new world in California as we're uh, exploding toward 50 million people in this state. And how in the world are we going to deal with uh, the biggest problem, in my opinion? And by the way, it's been opinion, it's been, has been my opinion for uh, 40 years. Uh, that the biggest problem in the state is water. So, and uh, a lot of folks agree with that. Now, Minnesota has all kinds of water. I'm from Minnesota. I was born there. Um, when I was four years old, we crossed the Colorado River. My mommy sang to me, California, here we come. And she wanted to live here. But Minnesota has some water. It's got a lot of nice stuff. It's a very pretty place. And, uh, this is a family home. <coughs> Southeast Minnesota, and uh, that's my sister and I in Manorville, which is outside of Rochester, Minnesota, and that's the Mississippi River. So they don't have water problems there. They don't have very many people, and they got all kinds of water. We, on the other hand, have a whole lot of people, and we don't have a lot of water. Hey. Yeah, so that's a pretty serious thing. But guess what? We, Californians, are pretty rich, and we like to play golf. How are we going to provide for our golf courses? Do you think that can be done? Then we ought to just rip them all off and let natural vegetation take over. Think that's going to happen? Now, there's a lot of folks in this uh, society that like to play golf. Probably some in this room. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so here's some pictures of some pretty golf courses. And of course, we have one of the great golf courses of the world in San Diego. Pretty tough to beat San Diego. That's why people want to want to live in California, and they sure want to live in San Diego. A lot of people do. We love our green lawns. Now this is in my neighborhood. I'm going to show you pictures of my neighborhood. Uh, this is actually a, a different architectural version of the house that I live in. There was three or four different homes um, uh, built in 1989 when my wife and I bought our home, brand new. And this is a neighbor's home, and there's a lot of real pretty green grass, really nice there. But I'm going to give you a clue about what's coming. I don't pay the water bill they do. I really don't. Because my wife and I began to think about this in 1989 when we moved into our home. And these homes were, were classics. Uh, they were sitting on vacant, blank land. There was no grass provided by the contractor, nothing. And so the, the homes became kind of customized as time has gone by. That's what it means. Green is not sustained. Green in the sense of green grass. And we like green grass. Don't we like green grass? 
traditionally, this is not, of course, entirely true, but traditionally, Californians have come from the Midwest. They've come from elsewhere in the United States. We even have at least one New Yorker in our room. That's right. And New Yorkers are used to green grass. They spray water all over the place. Uh, they've got a lot of water. But um, us Californians don't have so much water. So how are we going to maintain our green grass? Well, let's look at some problems, urban problems in the world. Uh, this is entitled Creative Solutions. I hope I come up with something you hadn't thought of before. Not sure I will, but I'll try. Uh, what are the problems? They're not just not simply water. One of the problems that relates to water supply in the sense of heating up our environment, which causes greater evaporation of limited water resources. One of the problems is the urban heat islands. Uh, our world is greatly urbanized. And because it's urbanized, cities draw heat and absorb heat. Now, they absorb heat in two ways. And this is kind of an ironic example that I've got here on display. Uh, because Lima, Peru, is not a hot city. It's actually a very cool city. It sits right on the coast uh, uh, of the Humboldt Ocean Current, the largest cold water current in the world. And because of it, uh, they get six months a year that are pretty heavy fog. They even have a word for it, the Garua. is a fog that is so clear it says there it poses no problem to visibility but so wet that divers drivers i think are to have to use windshield wipers and you notice the people on the streets there are wearing jackets so it it can be pretty cool uh even though it's not it's well, i don't know what it is nine degrees south of the equator maybe eight seven degrees it's close to the equator uh, and yet it's cool the reason i show the picture is that uh, cities draw heat not only horizontally from all of the blacktop. Here you can see some blacktop there. And uh, the hard surfaces. Uh, but we have vertical surfaces that draw heat. And those vertical surfaces uh, heat up the, the urban environment. And uh, so that is a problem. Here's a better example. Uh, I was here, by the way, the year before last. And I took that picture. Uh, I was in Panama in June. And here's a picture of Panama City. Looks like there's a lot of traffic there. They're heating up the world, aren't they? Uh, with their exhaust. And look at all the blacktop. All kinds of blacktop. Looks like a border crossing. It's a toll booth. That's what it is. Uh -huh. from, from the Am Amador Causeway. Coming from the south and going into downtown Panama City. Did you know there was high rises like that in Panama City? Uh, oh boy, there are. If you think you were in Hong Kong or you're in New York City. This is just a small picture of the high rises going for miles and miles and miles. Uh, this, this building right here that was not complete in June, uh, built by Trump. And there are lots and lots of condos. Americans like to go down there. It's a really friendly environment for Americans retiring. In fact, I told my wife five years ago, let's go down there and buy a condo. And my wife, him and Todd, for about three or four months, refused to answer. And then she finally said, well, I, I don't ever want to be that far from my grandchildren. So we never bought that condo. I wish I had because I could have bought a $300,000 con condo today for $70,000. Hmm. And I could have done it five years ago, I knew it. Okay, now what you see here, these numbers are going to, are there to illustrate the fact that this is an urban heat island. You can pick just about any day of the year, and it's going to be five degrees warmer in Panama City than it's going to be in Coronado. Now, you think Coronado is across the bay. Well, there's another Coronado that is probably the most rapid, gro rapidly growing beach community in the country of Panama. And lots and lots of Americans are buying condos there and golf course homes and so forth. And it's the dry, driest part of Panama. They only get about 70 inches of rain a year. If you look at the L in, no, the S in Isla Taboga, Isla Taboga. The island Isla Taboga is right there. But where the letter S is, is where the city of Coronado is. And I don't know what the population is, maybe 20,000. Uh, I had an apartment there for the month of June, 
in Gorgola Beach, which was a lot like Coronado, but cheaper. Yeah. Just down the, up the beach, about uh, three miles. And look at the temperature. Now this is today. Uh, this is today, this is predicted tomorrow, this is predicted the day after tomorrow. And 83 degrees in Coronado, 88 degrees, you see the idea here in Panama City. Panama City is right on the same coast. Why is it warmer? It's about five degrees warmer. Um, and that is very, very typical. So what is the answer to the heat island problem? Or what is an answer? And there's actually, uh, I think, a brilliant answer. Uh, if we have vertical heat draw as well as horizontal heat draw, how can we mitigate that? Well, California does have a problem with water, and we do have lots of evaporation. Um, the day I drove by Glamis, some of you know where Glamis is in the uh, Imperial Valley sand dunes. There's a community there, about eight or 10 or 12,000 people, uh, up by the Dumont dunes in Inyo County, right on the border with San Bernardino County. Uh, they have weekend communities that grow to 30,000 people. The RVers go there, it's kind of interesting interesting world. But they don't try to grow grass, you can see that. The answer is green roofs, or one answer, one real strong, important answer is green roofs. Now this is in the Faroe Islands. Just out of curiosity in the classroom, how many people knew where the Faroe Islands were? Right? No. Several of you. Very good. Okay. Mostly professors, by the way. Good. Um, the Faroe Islands. They're located right here between Norway and Iceland, right there. Uh, they're owned by Denmark. And just out of curiosity, if anybody wants this PowerPoint presentation or is interested in any of these things, please email me at the regular uh, sdccd.edu website um, or, or email site, jmason at sdccd.edu. Uh, because I've got some interesting links, uh, I think many of you find interesting. Uh, here is a presentation of uh, the language, Faroese, which is a Nordic language. It's one of the four languages descended from the Norse people or the, the Western Vikings. And it is rather uh, rather interesting. It's it sounds quite different than say Swedish that we're, we may be most of it. Green roofs. Green roofs are, are historically well established. <clears throat> when the Europeans came to Nebraska, they had green roofs. They had sod roofs in their homes. There's a number of advantages of them. And green roofs are gaining popularity worldwide. This is the rooftop of the Chicago City Hall. Isn't that interesting? They decided to do a green roof. And you you can gain access to a lot more information if you have an interest in green rooms at those websites. Email me for this. I'll send you the PowerPoint show if you're interested. There's some more in uh, green rooms. Uh, the one on the uh, upper right is in France. The one on the upper or bottom left is in Greece, in Athens. And this looks like a park, but it's actually the top of the Treasury Building in Athens, Greece. And uh, it would seem that green roofs would be awfully heavy, doesn't it? You need a lot of construction modification to current buildings uh, or that you would uh, need to build with a green roof in mind because plants grow in dirt and dirt is quite heavy. Well, we have answers to those problems. And there's some, some good answers in Let's, uh, let's read through the advantages to green roofs. Uh, the most obvious benefit are storm water management and reduced energy cost. Why reduced energy cost? Um, green roofs uh, do a brilliant job of restricting heat and saving heat beneath those roofs. And, uh, in sort of drainage, and San Diego, of course, has got terrible drainage problems. My goodness, every time you go to the beach, they're saying don't swim because of the runoff, and, and it's bringing pollutants to the ocean, and we don't want to swim. And uh, we all swim anyway because we look so fine in our 
swimming apparel. All of us, don't we, in this room? <laughs> okay. Uh, number two, green roofs reduce the heat island, uh, urban heat island effect. Grape, uh, common to most large cities. Due to the ability of plants to transpire, that means they give up water to the atmosphere, uh, and also to shade the land. Use of green roofs throughout large cities can cause a cooling effect, lowering the temperature in city environments. Now, you may think that this is something that won't catch on, it's not going to have much influence worldwide, but it actually is. Uh, in, the, in Germany, in the cities of Germany in the last five years, about 60% of new construction, and I intended to look up the exact statistic uh, this week and I forgot and I apologize now that I'm jabbering from memory, 60% is, is not a real accurate number, but a very high percentage of new construction is green roof construction in Germany, in German cities. So. Uh, they're writing it into regulations in Germany. Okay, number three. Since green roof, green roof buildings are cooler and require less air conditioning, the subsequent ventilation of hot air from an air conditioner to the atmosphere is reduced as well. Uh, number four. Heat is not retained in green roofs the way it is in black roofs. Thus the city can cool more rapidly. The cooling at night is, is very important. Okay, um, Number five, green roof technology extends roof life. Now you may think, wait a minute, extends roof life? you got moisture in that roof. Isn't it going to rot everything underneath it? And the answer is no, not if you water, manage the water properly. Now in, in San Diego, there are a lot of people that love their green grass who manage their water very effectively. How many of you in the room, I, I'll bet you there's some. Remember, I'm, I'm guessing it was five years ago uh, that this guy that had a $6 million house, and five years ago, that was a whole lot. There's a lot more $6 million houses today than were five or six or seven years ago. But it was right above Black's Beach. Now, that would be a great place for a rich guy to own a home, especially if he had binoculars. Mm -hmm. Went down there at Black's Beach. But right above Black's Beach, I remember listening to a... Uh, geology professor from San Diego State talking to a journalist. I believe it was on KUSI News. Pretty sure it was. And what had happened is at the top in this guy's backyard, the backyard had given way and fallen down the cliff. And it was actually a part of his patio, thankfully not his home, that was actually hanging out in space. And the cliff went to within about three, four, uh, three feet of the corner of his house. He lost about, gosh, if memory serves, 18, 20 feet of his backyard. And the journalist, I thought was pretty sharp, he said to the San Diego State professor, why do, you, why do you suppose he lost his backyard? And the geography professor, I have to admit, was geology professor, was a sharp fellow also. He said, well, I did a little research He said, the fellow liked green grass in his backyard, and he watered it what averaged out to be 100 inches of water per year in his backyard. Now, does anybody know that water is heavy? And you know when it mixes with soil, it's slippery. Anybody ever notice that? <laughs> so this guy lost his backyard. He lost a million dollars worth of real estate. It just broke my heart you know, when this happened to these rich guys. I'm going to show you some other guys, rich guys' houses. When you look at my house, I hope you're all envious and think I'm one of them. <laughs> that would be very excellent. I would like that. Okay, right, let's go on. Uh, other green roof stuff that's going on in the United States and worldwide today. The picture in the top left, in fact, I want to take you to this website. Let's do it right now. Uh, this is the uh, California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, which happens to be my wife's favorite town. Her 40th wedding anniversary, I was going to take my wife on a vacation to the, uh, on a, a ship, uh, an ocean liner from 
uh, Dover, England to uh, St. Petersburg, Russia through the Baltic Sea. And I had enough sense to ask my wife if she liked that for an anniversary present. And what she said was, oh, Jerry, let's go to San Francisco. <laughs> I thought it would save me money. Okay, let's <laughs> uh, It didn't save me much money. That's a pricey town. Okay. This is the rooftop of the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. It's an all green roof. And let's go back to the beginning to read these. I think it's interesting. Floor to ceiling windows allow you to look into Golden Gate Park. And it's a beautiful park. Uh, 1.7 million native plants have been planted on the two and a half acre living roof. The building reflects our mission. Explore, explain, yeah, that's a mission. Uh, this is interesting. Recycled denim is used as insulation for the building. Isn't that creative? You know, I used to throw away my blue jeans when they get too many holes in them. But when my blue jeans get holes in them, I'm really good. So I like to wear them that way. Got that downgraded look. Um, so I'm going to send them to the Academy of Sciences now. Okay. What's number five? Why didn't that work? There. And of course, it's solar heating, the solar power the building is. So that's pretty creative, pretty inventive. Now, the top right is probably the most important picture I want to draw your attention to. Um, the green roof substrate made of recycled clay tiles. What <clears throat> we can do today, and there is profound, excellent, uh, agricultural technology that's been going on in the last 20 years particularly, particularly in, the, um, uh, in, in hydroponics, hydroponic gardening, gardening that doesn't even use soil at all. Uh, some fine hydroponic gardening, you get huge plants, very productive plants and yield wonderful fruit and so forth, uh, is using recycled coconut shells. And it's all uh, ground up, and it has nothing in it. So you can put whatever nutrients you want into it, and you can grow marvelous plants. And how much do you need? How about that thing? And you can grow marvelous green roofs, depending upon what you want to grow. If you uh, have drought-resistant plants, which we need in California, uh, not in Minnesota, the uh, Minnesota Arboretum uh, doesn't specialize in drought resistant plants but the finest arboretum in the world numero uno is in UC Davis and they do specialize in um, drought resistant plants so pretty thin not that heavy uh, a house built in the last 25 years would need some um, uh, structural support on average. But houses that are built for the future, which should be coming, in my opinion, and my opinion is worth, you guessed, just a whole lot. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, this is in Switzerland. Isn't that a gorgeous That's building? Look at that architecture. That's amazing. Just but uh, relatively thin soil and not soil at all. In this case, case um, clay tiles. Clay makes terrible soil. I don't know if you know that. You can't grow grass. You got clay in your backyard. I do. South Bay San Diego is, is uh, soil that derived from shale, mostly. And we call that kind of soil clay. And it clots. It clumps. And try to grow grass in my uh, neighborhood, it's hard to do. It takes a lot of effort. Okay, so the answer, natural, another answer, another solution, is natural landscape. Now, isn't that a pretty picture of Minnesota? Some beautiful Appaloosas, and they're just grazing wild in the summertime in Minnesota at a friend of my family's house. By the way, yes, I am from Minnesota, and yes, that's how you say it. <laughs> And if you're not sure, let me tell you, you betcha. How do you say it? If you're from Minnesota. 
the world. Or Finland. Why did I put pictures of Finland? Well, because I was there a few years ago and I took those pictures. And uh, I just wanted to take an opportunity to show you my pictures. <laughs> oh, and because this was a Finnish organization, isn't it? Nokia. We got two major plants, uh, Nokia operations in San Diego. One in Scripps Poway Parkway or off the parkway and one in uh, San, uh, Rancho Bernardo. And both of them are very effectively using natural landscaping. And uh, they're, they're doing a very good job of it uh, so that they can be very water wise. And there are others that are doing it, other businesses that are doing it. I'll show you something. Uh, here's a home project in uh, Carlsbad. I took this out of the San Diego Union Tribune, Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper, in March 23 of this year. And I'm not going to read the whole article. If you have an interest, email me. I'll send the article to you. Uh, but uh, all of the natural landscaping. If you were to read the whole article, and you notice there's a whole lot of words there, and it's all in English, so it may be hard for most of us to read. Hmm. But uh, on average, it'll cost the homeowner two to three thousand dollars more than a conventional home. And the result in Five, six years will be a payback on the water bills. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, five, six years, I'm guessing. I, and by the way, that is a guess. It's not an educated, really, a very well educated guess. I should talk to my neighbors. My neighbors don't like me very much, though. <laughs> because my wife and I made a decision not to do the Midwestern thing and not to have green grass. And I actually got in trouble in my neighborhood in 1989. The Homeowners Association came after me. They're a frightening organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you don't understand people that are control freaks, and you've never been involved in a homeowner association. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a great housing project. And you can see right from construction time, there, there, a lot of people are solar, using solar energy to reduce our energy problem. But today I'm not going to be talking so much about energy problems. Now solar turbines is just a few miles away from here. It's a cat, it says Caterpillar Company on there. It's a major employer in San Diego. And uh, look at their landscaping. Uh, they have um, um, won international awards right here in San Diego, as well as uh, nationwide awards for their landscaping effort. They've done a brilliant job of landscaping and using recycled water. Uh, I didn't put into uh, to this lecture, I intended to, and I didn't get to, if I have time, which I'm sure I won't, uh, the use of recycling rainwater and so forth. Uh, there's amazing technology. Gosh, I, I should have put a slide or two in on it. And forgive me, I didn't. Uh, if I have a moment, I, I can take you to something I have available. All right, <clears throat> this is the landscaping, and there's a lot, this is a parking lot. By the way, this is the employee park. This is the employee park. They don't have a whole lot of trees. They do have some. Now, these are interesting trees. They take very little water. <laughs> Actually, they don't take any water. And they do have plants in the center. They have soil and uh, some uh, plants that sometimes the year are flowering uh, inside these metal structures. And they, they uh, flower based upon rainwater. So depending on the season, and they were brand new. This was this picture was taken in March, uh, so this March, in March of 2011, uh, they will be flowering. Uh, but they had just completed this landscape. It was very, very new when I took these pictures. I took these in, in March of this year. It's a real pretty area. This is all parking lot. This whole area is parking lot. A lot of rocks. Very pretty, very attractive. And they have walkways throughout, uh, but they don't, you know, separate from the planted areas. Uh, can we do that in our homes? Well, honest to goodness, this was very unpopular. I've already given you a clue that uh, my wife and I had to deal with some problems in our, with our own homeowners association uh, when we built, when we bought our home in 1989. Now, the, probably, I don't know if this is true, but I would guess it probably is true, that the most award-winning development in America, 
for its landscaping creativity is in San Diego. And it is the Santa Luz uh, development, uh, as which is part of Carmel Mountain Ranch. Some of you know that. It's just west of Rancho Penasquitos, if you drive by there, and just immediately south of the west part of Rancho Bernardo. And these are very wealthy homes. Really, really wealthy. What they did, the, uh, the city of San Diego uh, planning department was very irritated with all of the building and, uh, and they wanted to take Carmel Mountain Ranch and basically steal it from the, the, uh, the owner of the property. And he had 6,000 acres. And I'm relying on memory. I read about this and studied this at a seminar that I, uh, or a conference that I attended in last March and when I took these pictures. Not all of the pictures, because I'm going to go back to Santa Luz to show you a dry, to show you dry season pictures. But um, uh, relying on memory from that conference, I believe it was about 6,000 acres. And the city of San Diego just basically put thumb screws to the, the landowner and said, you're not going to build on this. Give it to us. Well, the landowner didn't want to give it to him. Them. They're a bunch of corrupt capitalists. You know that. They wanted to make money. They wanted to take their money and put it in the Grand Cayman Islands and hide it. They're all rich people, a bunch of evil people. So uh, they negotiated and they negotiated and they negotiated, and San Diego City got about uh, about 3,500 acres out of the 6,000, more than half, and made it a total open space, to be open space forever. And then they negotiated with the developer to develop this project, Santa Luz. Now, Santa Luz has 1,000 homes. Now understand, they have 2,000 acres and 1,000 homes. And what they developed was instead of every home having two acres, that's really cool, or two and a quarter acres or whatever it would average out to, they clumped their houses together so that they would have six, eight, nine, ten, that's about the maximum. That really is just about the maximum. And then they'd have open land between. And the open land was not to be watered. It was all to be naturally irrigated by rainwater. Well, that's a big problem in San Diego because we have four months of rain, and often less than that. Sometimes we have five months. What a wonder that a good thing we had this early, this early rain in October. Remember, the, uh, it got so hot, and then I was teaching my class, and I was showing them where the high pressure and the low pressure was. Uh, you guys remember that really well, don't you? Don't you, don't you remember that? You're supposed to say that. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I said, if that low pressure moves, we can suck in the Santa Ana. And if the high pressure moves downward, we'll have Santa Ana. And in October, when you have Santa Ana, the world catches fire. And it's a serious thing in San Diego. Driest month of the year, October. Well, we got this wonderful rain. That's cool. Darn it. Uh, so is that going to burn? Now, you may look at this landscape and say, wait a minute, is that all open space? Yeah, it is. And I'm going to, I take, took this picture, and then I'm going to turn like this and take a picture in a little bit other direction, about 70 degree angle. That'll be the next picture you'll see. And you'll see a lot of really green land, but none of it is irrigated. Remember, this picture was taken in March. March is the end of the rainy season, and we do have three weeks a year in San Diego that's really pretty and green. Yeah, this was the three weeks. Uh, so you can see it's really pretty and green. But what's going to happen in October when Santa Luz is not going to water any of that land? What's it going to look like? We'll find out. This is more pictures in October. And these are clumps of homes. And you may be looking at that and saying, boy, those are rich houses. And I drove up on Sunday. My wife and I drove up to take pictures to see October brown, dry pictures, see what it would look like where it's a naturally landscaped uh, 2,500 or tw over 2,000 acres housing project. A thousand homes clumped together. And they did it really creative, by the way. Some areas were uh, homes on half acre, three quarter acre properties. 
A lot of homes were like that, but they were clumped to get they're clumped together. So you have six or eight homes on half acre, half three quarter acre. That's pretty common uh, home size. And then they had other homes clumped clumped together right next to each other, almost like condominiums, although not having common walls. Real, real, real close together. So the, the walls of homes are five, six feet apart. And they were really close together. And then they had to have a larger open space area surrounding that clumping of homes. And these are all very big homes, you know. Uh, I don't know if they have anything under 2,500 square feet. They might. I don't know. Very costly homes. And by the way, you may be thinking, wait a minute, it's going to save a whole lot of money to not have to water all of that land. Uh, not really. Not really. But I'm an optimist. And I, I am a forever optimist because I've lived long enough to see that answers to real problems can be found right here. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm so deeply convinced of that, that mankind, if he doesn't take his time to kill each other, mankind can find solutions to every imaginable problem. Well, one of the problems we have today is the cost of maintaining this land. You see, these people in these rich houses, all a bunch of rich executives making these horrible salaries, the kinds of people we love to hate. Uh, these people, uh, they want to go walking their dogs through those fields. And you know what? Most of the year it's really dry, and you get a whole lot of thistles and stickers, and it's real nasty. And when your poodle is groomed just right, you don't want your poodle coming home with all of those thistles and stickers. So they're going to hire land and have part of the homeowner fees, which are very, very costly, is to maintain all of those open space areas, keep them cut low. So with no watering, they're not a fire hazard. Does that make sense? And with no water, and by the way, I mean zero water, uh, they are going to have some trees scattered, but they're going to be drought resistant trees. And they're going to have uh, uh, um, no thistles and thorns because they're going to use pesticides. I don't have time again to, to, to show you. I, I can talk about a good deal about uh, organic and natural. Uh, organic is the wrong word. It's another word I want. But natural pesticides that are not chemical pesticides and that are being developed out of UC Davis also, by the way. Um, environmentally friendly pesticides. A real pretty place. Real pretty place, real pretty homes. Real rich people. You know, very rich. When you walk by them, they don't look at you. You know what I mean? They raise that. They look down at you. Actually, they don't look down at me. <laughs> they really don't. Everybody looks down at me. I'm kind of sure. Okay, this is a golf course right there. And so I just lied to you, didn't I? All these rich people, they want to have their stinking golf course. And how are they going to do How are they going to maintain their golf course? They've got a great big golf course there. Covers a zillion acres. And what are we going to do with that golf course? We're going to water it. How do you have a golf course in September and October without watering it? They're going to water it. It's going to cost a lot. Really? And it was where it was really green and really pretty back then. Now this is Sunday. My wife and I drove there, and I went up to the gated entryway, and I said, "I'm a professor at Mesa College, and you got to let me in because I want to see some pictures." And the guy looked at me and said, "Not letting you in." And uh, my wife said, "Told you so." So we skirted around the outside and took pictures from the outside. <laughs> If I had made an appointment, I could have gotten it, but I didn't think I had. But this is the entry, and notice, please, the background. It is brown, is it not? It's very brown. Those hills are very brown. But look at up here. We have all drought-resistant plants. These are not water. I'm sure there is some irrigation during the, like if you have Santa Ana days, they will have soakers or light sprinklers. But drought-resistant plants. Uh, species that are being developed <coughs> primarily again at the UC Davis Arboretum. And uh, this is an arboretum that has, I believe, 11 different locations in California where they're growing different climate-specific plants for these specific areas. 
if any of you want to grow some of these plants, would you please contact me, and I could put you in touch with people there, and, and it would be a joy for me to do that. So it doesn't look so green now, does it? These are some of the same homes I was taking pictures of. Big old homes, don't you think? That's on telephoto, so it looks close, but it's, th those homes are half a mile away from where I took this, this picture. And this was on Sunday. And the golf course is green. Yeah, those stinking rich golf course people. But low cut, no weeds. I went walking up there and I didn't have any stickers in my socks. I didn't have my granddaughter with her. She would have found a sticker. She would have. You guys really need to see my granddaughter. I think you do. Do you think so? I, I think you do. No, it's not the next slide. No. I'm going to show you my granddaughter. Yeah, those rich bastards. Water wasting golf course. Really pretty though. A lot of eucalyptus, which thanks to Australia, has uh, developed a, a very drought resistant, gorgeous tree. My wife looked at all of that and made a comment. My wife is way more knowledgeable than I am of, of botany. Way more. She's an accountant by trade, but, but she's way more knowledgeable. In fact, I had her take me around our backyard and name all the plants, hoping I would remember the names. I don't think I will. Santa Luz Club is now receiving recycled water from North City Water Reclamation Plant for its two golf courses. The recycled water is delivered through the Black Mountain Recycled Water Pipeline. The golf courses were designed and built to receive recycled water. Yeah. Uh, San Diego is early worldwide in the use of recycled water. The project in uh, Santee goes back 45 years, where they're, they're, they're reclaiming water, something like that. Now we're leaving Santa Luz, and look at the landscaping along the way. It's very nice landscaping, and it's all drought resistant, very much drought resistant. It's not brilliantly green. I meant to take pictures, and then I couldn't find any when I set, assembled all of this, of beautiful, bright, brilliant green uh, mediums between highway lanes. We have quite a lot of them in San Diego. And you know what? We just can't afford any of them. They just need to go away because they, they're, they're water hogs. That's my opinion. I, I hope I'm not offending you guys. But I'm in the right environment. You guys are probably agreeing with me. If you're not, at least you're courteous. I appreciate that. Now this is two doors over from my house in Emerald Ranch, uh, up on top of a hill in Benita. You can see from that first picture, I live on a hilltop. And it is a very beautiful area. Uh, this tree is not drought resistant. Palm trees are not terrible bad on water, but these these varieties are, are they use a lot of water. A lot of these guys use a lot of water. They have beautiful lawns. And my neighbors are pretty wealthy. I'll be honest with you. Uh, this is looking, uh, out my office window at my neighbor's backyard. And that's pretty nice. He's got a big old pool. I mean, a big old pool out behind. And he's, he's a doctor. He's a pathologist for Kaiser. And uh, great guy. Really, really great guy. Uh, he doesn't seem to care what his water bill is like at all. Now, right along this fence, right here, my wife told me this this morning, because I asked my wife what our water bill was. My wife pays the bills around the house. I don't know. You know, but I know our water bills are low. And I asked her uh, what they were like and, and how much she waters. Because I don't manage that. My, my wife does. And, uh, and <laughs> what she told me, actually didn't surprise me, she said, well, we don't water. I said, well, wait, wait a minute. Right along that fence, we have got gorgeous, big hedge of bushes. And they're beautiful. And I said, well, what do you mean we don't water? We don't water that side of the yard? She said, no. Don't water it ever. I said, you've never watered? She said, no. She said, the neighbors water a lot. <laughs> and our soil draws the water from the neighbors. <laughs> and we believe that the roots to our hedges 
go under the wall and collect from our neighbor. And I want to be, and when I get home, I'm going to be sure to knock on my neighbor's door and express my appreciation. <laughs> okay, and there's a nice neighbor's front yard. Lovely, lovely. This is my neighbor to the north. This is my other neighbor. Um, between my house and this house, there's a, uh, a, a horse trail. And you can, uh, oh, I'll show you the horse trail. In any event, you can see they got a swimming pool too, and they've got these beautiful edges. I don't see anything drought resistant, do you? I mean, I'm not a botanist, I'm really not. I just don't see anything drought resistant. These people own a landscape company, by the way, and they have, re it's really beautiful, look at it, gorgeous. And I just didn't care what their water bill is. But I care, this is my house. And that's the front lawn of my house, part of it. I'll show you another view. Uh, we bought it in 1989, 21 years ago, and got in trouble with the HOA. Why is that? The Homeowners Association, they came to us and they said, your front yard looks awful. And thankfully, they didn't say that to me. I let my wife deal with that kind of crap. I didn't want to talk to any of them. And my wife just said, oh, what do you think we should do? And they said, well, you ought to rip that out, put in grass. And my wife said, well, thank you, you know, for that information. And 21 years later, we still don't have any grass. And I asked my wife, I said, how much do we water in front? I mean, look, you can see a sprinkler head. We've got underground irrigation. And she said, well, you know, this time of year, Summertime and early fall before the rains come, yeah, we, we water. Said, but mostly we don't water. Mostly we don't water. At all. Zero. And this, uh, by the, these trees right here, I'll give you another view. These trees are Melaleuca, which are a uh, lovely, fragrant uh, eucalyptus variety. Here's the horse trail. This horse trail goes all around Bonita, actually connects. Uh, naturally with the Pacific Crest Trail, kind of an interesting little <coughs> of irrelevant information. And, uh, and, and it was pretty, my house is so pretty. I have a three-year-old granddaughter, and after I came home from Panama, I got my granddaughter every Thursday, and I would take her <coughs> over. And every Thursday, we would walk around the front and back lawn and clip flowers. And my wife would come home, we'd have a vase full of flowers. And my granddaughter would say, oh, let's get that flower, let's get that flower, let's get you know, and I let her pick them. And every week we had, all summer, up until about three weeks ago, the flowers began reducing. We have fewer and fewer flowers. We do have some grass. That's most of what the grass we have in our backyard. And here you don't see the uh, the row of bushes, but to the right, it's there's a, more of these bushes. And my wife. Oh, she said that she waters the grass, and that is it. And uh, beyond the grass and that relatively small expanse of grass, everything you see is simply not water. You're right, not water. There's uh, <clears throat> the other part, and another part of the backyard, and uh, uh, again, we, we don't water. Now, in the wintertime, you get low grass in here, and it greens up. It's really kind of pretty, uh, but it's very low grass. And, and uh, my wife has a landscaping company that comes in and clips it, gets rid of weeds and stuff. But, um, and look at the pepper trees and the palm trees. We don't water them. They are not watered. My wife uh, told me to be sure to show you, but she said it this morning and I already said it this, uh, something, our bottleneck. Was it a bottleneck palm tree? See, I cannot remember. So really one she's really proud of. And it's not in this picture, so I'm apologizing to my wife, to you, okay? If she asks you, tell her you saw the truth. <laughs> and that's my granddaughter. My wife and, and my granddaughter, Genevieve, were, were walking in the horse trail. This is the, the horse trail between us and the neighbor to the north. And, and I saw him when I was in the backyard. And I got a little telephone effect, but you can see this was taken in May. And you can see there's all kinds of problems. There's all kinds of problems. All okay, let's uh, conclude by talking about Pat Brown's decision. Now, um, I remember this really, really well uh, because my graduate school, I was in graduate school at UC Davis, and 
I was there um, in 1969 and 1970. And this uh, world's greatest public works project ever, the most costly public works project maybe ever or until very recently. There might be something bigger. Uh, but I, I'm including the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm including the Hoover Dam, the great public works projects. Uh, this was the costliest that ever existed. And it is, was pretty much thanks to uh, Edmund G., also known as Pat Brown, who is the daddy of um, the uh, fellow running for governor, Jerry Brown, today. And uh, Pat Brown, possibly the most popular governor in California history. I don't know if that's true, but he won in landslides. Why anybody bothered to run against him was amazing. He was governor from 59 to 67, so I remember him very well and very positively. And he wanted his legacy. I mean, according to his biography, he said, my legacy is the Central Valley or the, the California Water Project, CWP, California Water Project. And he pushed through and built a 444 mile long project. We uh, grabbed the water going as far north as the Feather River and sucked that water, put it in these canals, and shipped it all the way to Magic Mountain, actually Castaic. And below that, near Silmar, we got a big old lake. And uh, if you drive Interstate 5 going to, what's the name of that place up there? Magic Mountain. Uh, you'll see the huge water pipelines coming down the mountain, bringing that water from Northern California fantastically costly. And here's what I thought based upon what my geography professors taught me at Southwestern College and at San Diego State. And now I'm at UC Davis. I'm thinking Mrs. Menzel back at Southwestern College in introductory physical geography said California was going to have a population of 35 million in the year 2000. There isn't that much water, people. We can't get that much water from Northern California. They don't have enough for themselves with the amount of population we have in Northern California and Southern California. This water is supplying water, primary supply of water for, I just read this, I, I checked this out online. So this is an up-to-date statistic. 29 million people. 29 million people. Holy mackerel. And all of these people want to play golf. <sighs> On green golf. How they going to do that? Well, when I was in graduate school, we had a seminar where we dealt with this problem. <coughs> it's probably my favorite course in graduate school. It's my favorite professor, my major professor. And uh, the question was, what are alternatives? Understand, the politics were done. The money was requisitioned. The shovels were digging in the Central Valley. The water was beginning to flow. But what are the alternatives? Kind of late to ask that question, but guess what? We've got to ask that question again today because we're, we, Pat, Mrs. Menzel was right about the population of California in 2000. She got her demographics right. And uh, uh, one of my two favorite professors was my very, very first year. And, uh, and now they're saying we're going to have 50 million in 2050. And I think they're right. I do. I think they're right. Or over, well over 50 million population in California. Uh, and Northern California doesn't have enough water. And Mark is not going to put up with us taking any more of their water. He's just, he's just not, not going to go with that. So what did we talk about? Here's what we talked about in our graduate, in, uh, the graduate seminar. We talked about one of America's great aquifers that sits underneath the Mojave Desert. Uh, we have the San Bernardino Mountains, and for geologic time, it's been raining on the San Bernardino Mountains, right? And that rain funnels down the Mojave River. And there's a few places where the Mojave River flows above ground, right here through Victorville. Well, there's Victorville, right? Somewhere around here. Victorville, wherever the heck it is. And, uh, and at Barstow, rarely it'll flow above ground. And then up here, shoot, I can't remember the name of that place. I 
I can't remember. I don't know why. Please forgive me. I've been there a dozen times. I don't know why I can't remember. The river actually flows above ground. But it's a big volume of water that flows underground. And underground has a wonderful advantage. An aquifer underground has the advantage of no evaporation. The sun doesn't cook away the water. And how much water exactly do they actually have in the Mojave Desert? Well, that's how much water they have. This is uh, Newberry Springs right here, Kabang. And right here, a place named Harvard. If you drive to Las Vegas, and I realize a lot of you in this room sometimes run out of money, so you need to, you know, whip up to Las Vegas to fill up your bank account. I understand that. So if you're driving to Las Vegas, next time when you see the sign Harvard, look to your left. You're going to see big old water ski lake. And it's a big one. It runs for about a half a mile. It runs in a horseshoe shape. And it's been abandoned now. They, they, somebody tried to make a magic mountain. No, no, no. A, uh, like a not very fine kind of place out of it. And it, uh, I'm sorry, was there a cutting? No, uh, a water park, right? A water park, that's exactly. And the thing failed, uh, but it's still full of water. They got pumps sucking it out of the desert, and it's just full of water. And it's 115 degrees there, and the, the, the humidity is, you know, 8% humidity, and it's just sucking, evaporating water out. And that thing is full, bank to bank. And by the way, I go by there all the time, because I own a place right up here, right up here, uh, outside of Death Valley, that my wife and I like to go to in the winter. So I drive by there all the time. But in any event, there is all kinds of water in the Mojave Desert. In fact, there's a contract right now, I just read about it, uh, uh, with the Metropolitan Water District to possibly buy two million acre feet from the Mojave Desert. Why is that? Because the Feather River Project, the Central Valley Project, whatever water project you want to call it, uh, isn't supplying enough water. We don't have enough water. Colorado River doesn't have enough water to support Southern California. And the idea that we came with, I thought it was so brilliant, and I thought it was the right thing back in late 69 or early 70, I can't remember what semester it was, was to siphon and just mine the water out of the Mojave Desert and take the money that we don't spend on the Feather River project and use it for desalination. Because we have the Pacific Ocean and there's water out there. Some of you noticed that. Some of you were out there last this summer looking fine. Like you know, while you were swimming in the Pacific Ocean off San Diego this summer, I was swimming in the Pacific Ocean off Panama, and it was 87 degrees. <laughs> I gave up swimming off our ocean some years ago. Uh, this is an interesting article from uh, last February uh, by Lionel Van Dierlen. He was a Southwestern College professor, interestingly, uh, and then he went into politics and became a state senator, and was for years and years and years. He's retired now. San Diego has one of the most interesting histories uh, relating to desalination that you'll find anywhere in the world. And that is that in 1964, and, and Lionel Van Dierlen writes about this article, writes about that in the article, uh, we had a problem with a guy in Cuba by the name of Castro. And Guantanamo Base in Cuba, located right there, is an American territory. I actually know a lot about it. My sister and brother-in-law, when their kids were little, worked there for about three years. They lived on the base as a private contractor. And uh, my, my sister has a wonderful story. She loved living there. But Guantanamo Base has no fresh water. It rains a lot, but it has no fresh water source. And so they had a contract with the government of Cuba for fresh water. And they piped it in. And then one day in 1964, uh, Castro phones uh, up Lyndon Johnson. And he says, hey, big guy, you Texas uh, hero you, uh, I just shut off the water. Uh, time for you to get the heck out of Guantanamo Base. And so what did, what did Johnson do? Well, he talked to people in California and he uh, talked to this Navy people. It is a Navy base. And the Navy said, you know, we've got an experimental desalination plant on Point Loma, San Diego, California. 
1964. And you know what? In a matter of months, they dismantled that plant in Point Loma and they moved it thousands of miles, 2,500, whatever it is, to Guantanamo based Cuba. And it continues to provide fresh water for the Navy base and all of the, and that controversial prison. You know the prison I'm talking about, the one that our president shut down, he was going to do within a year. That's the prison I'm talking about. And uh, Guantanamo Base, the water is from San Diego. So why doesn't San Diego have desalination today? It's coming. It's on its way. Because the answer that, that I believed, in other words, I don't remember if the class as a whole said we could use this money better by, by um, mining the Mojave Desert Aquifer. That would, water would we, it'd run out. There isn't enough water to last very many years. But enough to last some years. And remember I told you I'm an optimist? It's part of why I believed it was the right answer is that I figure if we can take billions with a B, and remember in the 1960s, that was actually a lot of money. It was really a lot. Billions of dollars that apply it to desalination technology. We could bring the price way down, and we would have the Pacific Ocean as a water source. And it could work. Some people say, well, there are problems. There are problems. There are always problems. But people fail, in my opinion, and this is a philosophical issue to me that I think is significant. We fail to reason. We fail to realize that we have the answers. We fail to look into the future and say, the next generation has the answers. We might not have them right now, but the problems aren't going to go away. And temporary problems, or temporary solutions like the Central Valley Water Project, uh, they're, they're just that. So I'm all done, and I hope I didn't bore you to tears. Cross. So if you have any questions, yep. questions, answers, go right ahead. And I'm not ignoring you, at least not intentionally. This yeah. is not. And by the way, just so that you won't run out of water. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's real, real fun. I do not know why. The, oh no. Come on, Mason, you're such a clown. I was supposed to, I should be able to darken it. I'm supposed to have a darkening mic. Is there a question in the room on any topic? Yes, over here. Yes, sir. Dave. Just as a uh, context uh, issue, uh, in 1964, or 1962, the Supreme Court handed down a major decision telling the states that they had to be apportion themselves. Uh, and then in 1965, California adopted uh, the program. And so as a result, because all of the open space in Northern California had 23 senators, Los Angeles had just one senator in the whole county of Los Angeles. Suddenly, California drops from 23 Senate seats in Northern California to 14 seats in Los Angeles. And I was in Northern California at that time, and I said, oh, there goes the water. And of course, that's exactly what starts and allows the water uh, project to uh, occur. On the Absolutely. Ground. And these are obviously these are state senators. I, I'm sure everyone knows. That. Yeah, yeah. That's that. That's very interesting. Yes. Sir? So, uh, um, basically, there's a few things which you didn't mention, which you say more. There are a few. Uh, for example, in Europe, you have the dual flush toilets, which I notice now they're selling kits at Home Depot and that which you can install, which would save water. And also in Japan, they have these uh, sink attachments you attach to the back of your toilet, where basically the water comes out and you can wash your hands with it before it goes into the tank for reflushing. And this would all save water if they were starting to do some of these things into newer buildings or new retrofits. Very good. There are lots of answers. There really, really are lots of answers. Uh, creative ideas. Now, our use of toilets. Southwestern College has a whole lot of these flushing toilets. Don't do we have some on, on this campus? Yeah, we do. Yes, sir. I'm going to suggest to Professor Berger that toilets are nothing more than a uh, 
vertical placebo of the water problem. 85% of all water used in California is for agriculture. Only 11% is used for domestic consumption. So you're not going to solve any water shortage by all the toilets in the world here. What, what, in defense of Pat Brown, he put in that canal. I didn't condemn him. Okay, yeah. I wasn't so it wasn't just for Southern California. He was supposed to sell that water all the way down the west side of the San Joaquin farmers. Still buying it today. That's true. For subsidized prices. That's true. But I think the way you should maybe find and, and it's a political football right now yeah. in Central Valley. It's a disaster. So the farmers were behind that canal, four square, and yeah. the political cloud. Right? They were. Anyway, the way you saw your problem here, I think financially with water, because if you tap into Mojave water, all you do is create a growth inducement. Out so a lot of those people that consume that water will be local, and you'll have more water to fill up here than. What you need to do, think about here in Southern California, is uh, you need to tier the water prices. In other words, up north, what we do, we'll, we'll sell you uh, your first 150 gallons a day of water for your for washing your car and your lawn. But once you go to 250, the price doubles. Once you go to 300 gallons a day, the price triples. Is people conserve water real fast based on the disincentive to use so much. That's so right. if you That's use right. that incremental amount for tiering your water prices, you could take that incremental amount over a baseline and finance your desalinization plants. Well, the biggest problem with desalinization plants is the cost of energy to ram that water through those osmosis filters. That's exactly right. Secondly, yes. you need to think about more uh, solar panels along the coast for a source of electricity for those plants. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, could you, did you all hear the remarks that have been made so far? Were they audible to you? Because, because they're very legitimate remarks. Are there other questions or other thoughts? Yes. yes. Yeah, this is probably going to be silly. But. <laughs> it is definitely silly. <laughs> so, well, we have like 90% of our water, they're like ocean waters and aren't rainfall. So, like, at the point when you, you know, with our population and everything, we're going to have to can we run dry our oceans too when we get to that? It's really not a renewable source. So I mean, is there just so much water that it would last forever? Or for, forever is an awful long time. But, I mean, yeah, for for a century, happen. for a century, uh, I I can't imagine. Another problem, maybe the bigger problem, is not that the oceans run dry, yeah, because theoretically the oceans won't run dry. dry because of the basic hydrologic cycle. But uh, the, the, um, the abundance of salt, the, you know, that, that we, what do we do with all that salt that we, that is a byproduct of desalination? That's gonna be a problem, big old mounds of salt. I believe that there are answers to that. Uh, I really do. Uses of salt that we've never considered before. The immediate answer is to dump it back in the ocean because <laughs> The amount of desal. By, by the way, I, part of the Van Dierlin's article and another article that I didn't show you uh, relates to the Carlsbad project uh, that's going on right now, the desalination plant that's going to produce. Gosh, I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember. 50 million gallons, but I don't remember how much. I mean, whether it's a month or a day, I don't remember. But it's, it's going to produce a lot of water. Uh, how many of you, just out of interest, have read about the read that they are making a desalinization desalination plant in Carlsbad? It's going on right now. Uh, uh, the Mar Marine Corps started it in uh, Camp Pendleton. Uh, they they desalinate uh, right now. So. And uh, our aircraft carriers have been doing it for a long time. But, sure, absolutely. <laughs> but they have the energy. They have the power. And, and that is the biggest problem. Mark brought up. The biggest problem is, is the energy use. It is a huge amount of energy used to desalinate. But I believe that there are answers we just don't have yet. We're using re reverse osmosis. Are there other answers? There are. Before reverse osmosis, there was uh, distilling. I mean, that's even more costly. Okay, are there other other questions in a row? Did I answer your question? By the way, I already I started blabbing in the night. Yeah, you blabbed it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so. Goody. I think like a long, probably like five or ten years ago, I read an article about say like Japan, where they had a device where they were using hydrogen and oxygen, and 
No, it really isn't. Uh, that concept is very usable. In my, this is my opinion. Uh, that concept is usable in the opposite direction. And that is to make energy using fuel cell. In other words, to separate hydrogen from oxygen. That is the problem we have. It's not bringing them back together. It's separating the two. Uh, that is our technological problem to be overcome. Um, but you can't do something. Oh, we can do it, yes, but it's costly to do it. It's difficult oh, okay. to do it. Uh, that, in, in my view, the, the fuel cell, when perfected, is the answer to energy problems. I think it's a better answer than solar panels, except for solar panels in outer space. Now that one, I'm, I'm really fond of. But anyway, I, I diverged pretty good, pretty effectively. Other questions or thoughts or comments or accusations? And uh, on the topic, on the topic, uh, Mark's comment. I wanted to, I want to build on Mark's comment uh, relating to to Ken's comment that they have creative toilets and all this kind of thing. It's absolutely true that that is a tiny fragment of the problem. Uh, the, the big problem is agricultural water in California. There's no question about it. On the other hand, all of these technologies work together. And as we focus as individual taxpayers and voters in California to deal with the water shortage, uh, answers to agricultural water will come up. And I believe there's, there's significant answers, primarily through uh, development of uh, crops that use less water. Well, what I wonder, I've always wondered, well, uh, they lose a tremendous amount of water because of evaporation. Evaporation, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. After every time I've seen those. And since they own the right of way, yeah. I don't know why those canals aren't lined on top with photovoltaic cells. I don't understand. If they would line up well, with uh, photo cells, they could, they could reduce their energy price by half. That, that is absolutely a brilliant, uh, a brilliant comment. Uh, the answer, I suppose, is as simple as the fact that the state of California is broke. And uh, I, I was going to make a remark about the wisdom of our, of our legislators in Sacramento. Um, but maybe I don't need to. But that water is sold to irrigation districts and it's sold to Metropolitan Water Authority in LA. Right. If they had increased the rate on them, they could pay for it by, from the rate payer. You know? The problem with Jerry, I don't think it's, it's technical so much as political. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have cities and counties that enforce water conservation right. or tiered price structure. It's, you know. it's moving that way. I, I think your comment is very, very good. Uh, it's very general. Can you give an assessment on how the impact on the uh, government budget in California is having in the you know sustainability of not only development but also alternative energy? Is there any shift to the private sector, or things are just pretty much going in reverse and stagnating? What would be your assessment of that? My assessment is not very favorable. I mean, we've got uh, proposition proposition 23 that's on the ballot now to go in the wrong direction, yeah. to go in the reverse direction because of the budget crisis. Okay, guys, those of you who need to be leaving, uh, thanks for hanging around and listening to me jabber. I appreciate it.